Today, with the rates now. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance and Analytics. Welcome to this post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today, I'm joined by Steve from Canstar. Hi, Steve. Hi, Martin. Great to have you back on again. Very important conversation, this, because, of course, the RBA, well, I came out with a 25 basis point rise on Tuesday, and that f- created a flood of reaction saying, hey, they're pivoting. But <laughs> then they went on to say, well, actually, rates are still going up. So what did you make of it? And, and I want to talk about some of the implications. Yeah, look, the, the RBA is giving a signal at that, that but, uh, yeah, we're going to slow this up a little bit because there's been just a lightning pace here, and I don't think... Um, uh, yeah, they're probably a little uncomfortable that they, you know, might could overshoot. So the signal is, look, we're going to slow down. But look, the last word uh, that the RBA governor put in his statement was, I'm going to quote, uh, we're still resolute, or the, the, the board is still resolute about returning inflation to the target and will do what is necessary. They were his last words in the statement. So nobody should think, oh, oh gee, he's halved it, it's only 0.25. Uh, that's the end of it, uh, hallelujah, because it's not. And he's been very clear that uh, uh, there, there will be further increases. The timing is up in the air, the magnitude is up in the air, but there will be further increases. So people have to be prepared for more to come and plan for it. I think that's a really important message, Steve, because I've already seen some of the property spruikers out there saying, hey, you know, don't <laughs> worry, prices are going to uh, go the other way and it's all going to be fine again. Um, and People need to understand two things. One is the existing rate rises have still got to propagate through the system, right? They're a couple of months mm-hmm. behind. And secondly, the RBA is going to take rates higher. We don't quite know exactly how high. You know, the markets are saying now a little less high than previously, but the chances are rates are going higher. This is not all over, is it? No, it's not. And, and you know, people people take a while to react to it. And, uh, and, and you know, the reaction is where it really does hit them in the, in the hip pocket. And, uh, and, you know, it's sort of a little bit, it's sort of academic when you see the rate increases go through, but it hasn't hit your, your household budget. It just becomes so real when suddenly you've got less to spend on groceries and almost no discretionary money to spend. That's when reality strikes and people start making decisions based on the reality of it. Uh, now, there is an exception to that, and that is um, investors. Investors did start exiting almost as soon as, uh, or slowing up at least, almost as soon as the RBA first moved. Uh, so, you know, all that record investor activity we saw, you know, 12 or 18 months ago, just, you know, just started to die off. And every month it started, it's fallen, the volumes have fallen. So they do react sooner because they say, look, prices are going to fall. I don't need to buy a house today. I live in a house. I'm fine. I'm not going to buy an inflated priced house uh, because I don't need to get in right away. Oh, wait until prices fall. So they are the exception of that rule. But, yeah, we will see this start to bite a lot more in the next few months, even if nothing else happens with rates, but something else is bound to happen anyway. Mm. And you did actually put out a release uh, a little while ago showing the cumulative impact of all the rate rises mm. since May, right? This was the sixth. I mean, they are quite substantial now, aren't they? Uh, look, the, with this one that came through on Tuesday, uh, the uh, the repayment on a $500,000 loan over 30 years, p and i is uh, principal and interest, is um, around $700 more than people would have been paying in April. Uh, so that's the cumulative effect of it already. Now, the big banks have varying views on where this is all going to end up. And Combank's lowest, they say 2.85% cash rate, but Westpac at the top end is saying 3.6%. Now, that still says we've got a few increases yet to come through. Uh, now, if it hits 3.6%, the cumulative effect on that $500,000 loan is going to be around $1,050 every month. Now, that just shows what a big deal this is for people and why they've got to really work on it now. Yeah, it is important. And interestingly, I've done quite a lot of detailed analysis down at the postcode level. And I'm worried to find that quite a few households are now 
putting more than 30% of their yeah. disposable income on their mortgage repayments. In fact, some are up towards 40, 42, 43%. And that's before all those rate rises come through. So it, it, we know that this is going to be a problem. Yeah. And uh, look, I keep reading this and it keeps, it keeps irritating me every time I read it. Um, it came out again the other day. Uh, the Reserve Bank said, look, 30% of households are well ahead with their repayments and, and won't be any worse off when the increases come through. Well, they can't be worse off because if they, uh, because they won't be getting ahead. They'll, they'll be, uh, their loan will go for longer. Uh, but that aside, there's still 70% of households that aren't in that strong position. Uh, so it affects people unevenly. People talk about monetary policy being a blunt instrument. Well, it's a blunt instrument because it hits everybody, but it hits people unevenly and it's not targeted where it really matters. Uh, the problem is that if you are a first-time buyer, bought on a, a low deposit, a big fat loan in the last 18 months, two years, you have a big loan and you have little equity and you stretched your income to, to be able to achieve the repayments. Uh, well, you know, those are the people that are really going to feel the pressure uh, in the future. And uh, the, the bank allows for a 3% buffer when you apply. 2.5 of that 3% buffer is now spent on the, repay on the increases that we've seen. Uh, now, that's getting scary because the buffer, you know, one more 0.5 or two more 0.25s and the buffer is gone. Uh, so it's that group that are really going to feel it, the, the more recent buyers. And it's worth remembering, of course, that APRA previously had taken the buffer down to 2.5%. So some of those will be actually even in a worse position. And I'd also make the point that sometimes the buffer and the calculations with regard to repayments and uh, outgoings tend to be a bit on the low side anyway. So, again, I'm seeing that in some of my data. And I think the other point that's worth emphasising, quite a few of those households who bought, bought in the same sort of areas. So we're seeing the pressure really in the high growth corridors where we've had a lot of new development, a lot of uh, first time buyers flooding in. So we, what we're seeing now are quite significant hotspots around the country where it's not just a few households, but it's quite a few households in the particular areas, which helps to explain why some of the property price falls are more extreme in those areas. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, it's, it's, it's always been the case where uh, governments are aware, the political parties are aware of this. Uh, they call it the mortgage belt. And uh, and it, it is that the, the more outer suburban areas, I suppose, you're, you're the expert in this, you can you can sort of elucidate more than I can on them. But the um, uh, it's it's those outer suburban areas, that the areas where uh, uh, houses aren't quite as expensive and, and first home buyers uh, can get into the market there. Now, that's where I guess the real pain is going to be felt. Uh, sometimes high-end properties come off faster, but they're obviously wealthier people who have built a buffer personally in their finances uh, over a long period of time. But it's those areas out in that mortgage belt that really do feel the pain when you get rising interest rates. Yes, and it's interesting looking at the latest census data, which is confirmed by my data, that in some of those outer suburban areas, 50 or 60% of people have mortgages, which is you know way above the national average in terms of just the proportion, because a lot of people bought recently and have big mortgages. And of course, they often are in situations where there's not a lot of infrastructure. So they're also paying a lot more to get around. So they're paying more on, on, on petrol and, and other fuel. So mm. you can see some of these sort of characteristics begin to begin to wind forward. And that's why this is an important conversation, because uh, even if uh, people had buffers, well, some of the people, you know, are getting those buffers reduced. But a lot of these people never had the buffers in the first place. Yeah, yeah. You, you need time to build a buffer. That's, that's the issue. You, you need time and you need surplus income. And, and, and also the desire and the awareness, that's the other thing. Uh, but the, um, uh, now, obviously, if you're a, a more recent buyer, you have not had that time. You've already stretched yourself anyway to get there. You've probably been putting a little bit of money into those renos that everyone thinks they have to do. And, um, uh, and, and they're the ones that are really going to suffer with it because they haven't had time, but the income has been stretched too. Uh, and so, you know, there's, there's, not, there's not a lot of places where they can go at the moment, but just sort of tighten the belt.
Yeah, tightening the belt indeed. Now let's just talk a little bit about what the banks did because uh, you know we quite often find there's a bit of a sort of a silence once the Reserve <laughs> Bank moves. There was no silence this time, was there? No, um, it was funny. I mean, only a month ago they were all doing these things where they wanted somebody else <laughs> to to actually make the first announcement. Well, they all fell over themselves to get out there first this time, yeah. and uh, and by nine thirty or something on uh, on Tuesday. Uh, they'd all made their announcement. So uh, so that was quite a departure. I haven't quite seen it happen that quickly before. Uh, but I guess, look, nobody was under any misapprehension that they would put up their rates by 0.25% after the Reserve Bank went for that number. And maybe they felt, look, uh, <laughs> compared with the prior four months, um, uh, 2.5% is actually good news. So let's get out there with the good news. You know, I suppose it's just sort of good news if you have a particular view of the world. Um, and it's interesting, of course, that, that there are still some introductory offers and some teasers that the banks are using. Because if you look at the rate, latest data from the ABS, it was all about growth in refinancing, lower growth mm. in terms of other new loans. So the banks are really fighting over the opportunity to refinance. And some of the offers, therefore, are for lower loan-to-value loans. Um, some of those look quite attractive at the moment. Yeah, they are. And, uh, and they're, they're carving, look, half, half of the lenders have a lower price for a, a sub-70% LVR loan compared to an 80% LVR loan. So LVR is the loan to value ratio, and it's the inverse of the, uh, of the deposit amount. But if you have a deposit of 30% or more, uh, with half of the banks, you'll get a lower rate. Uh, so that's a simple way of putting it. Uh, so that says, look, they are very much encouraging people to uh, uh, to to uh, to refinance uh, because it's mainly for the refinance market. They're encouraging people to refinance into one of those lower rates. So there's quite a bit of opportunity there, uh, and and chances are, you know, you'll be with one of the banks that actually has this incentive for you know lower LVR loans, higher deposit loans. Um, but don't if, if you're going to the effort of looking and thinking about it and setting yourself up properly, don't stop there because you know you can still get loans uh, below four percent uh, when the average is up to five point two percent or something. Uh, so don't stop there. If you if you're going to the effort, you might as well go all the way and see what's the best deal you can get. And, of course, some people, uh, some of the banks are actually offering sort of cashback deals and things run at $4,000, $5,000 cashback, but they're not necessarily attached to the very best rates, are they? Yeah, some of them are, but some of them are not. Mm. Uh, so you've got to make sure you're getting the best rate. You've also got to remember that a 30-year loan has 360 repayments. Uh, the best cashback in the market uh, on a $500,000 loan will give you about one and a half repayments one and a half months worth of repayments, uh, and then you've still got uh, 358 and a half repayments to make. Uh, so take the bigger time, longer view, uh, you'll be stuck with this loan for some years, and if things get pear-shaped and get harder to refinance going down the track, you might be stuck in that loan for a long, long time. So take a long-term view. Yes, if two loans are equal, Grab the re grab grab the incentive. Grab the three or four thousand dollars. Why wouldn't you? But if they're not equal, take the better loan for the long term. And the other thing that uh, people are, need to be aware of is the extension of the term, because that's essentially what a lot of banks are now doing. So you know, you might be on seventeen years to repay, <laughs> and then they put up to twenty-five or thirty again, right? Which means yeah, that yes. you're, you're paying for a lot longer, which means you're going to be paying more interest. The monthly repayment does come down a little bit, but not dramatically so. But, of course, the uh, banks lock in a huge amount of extra interest over the longer term. Oh, yeah, they love it because if they've got a low LVR loan, somebody with a good credit rating, uh, steady income and, uh, and a good record, they love lending you money and love lending you money over a longer term. Uh, so it's great for them. Uh, from your point of view um, as, as, a, a, as a borrower, it's, it's, it gives you quite an opportunity if you have, let's say you've had your loan for 10 or 20 years um, and you really do strike very, very hard times. Well, you can refinance and, and, and start the clock again. Uh, so you can, you can knock your repayment down quite a bit. 
Uh, so, you know, and, and, and for the time that you're really in trouble, that's fine. But when, the, when you get through this, and everyone will get through this in time, if you hang in there and make your repayments, you'll get through it. Um, then you've got to reset it for yourself. Go into Casas Calculator and say, now I want to say this loan is a 20-year loan, not a 30-year loan. How much do I have to repay to do that? I, I used to, I, this is an analogy I've got, uh, we've all been in a car and the kids say, are we there yet? And uh, I used to say to my kids, oh, yeah, we're, we're an hour away. Uh, when they got a little bit older, they said, is this one of your rolling hours away, Dad, or is, this, uh, or is this a real hour? And I'd say, well, it's sort of a rolling hour. Now, if you keep refinancing into a 30-year loan and every few years you refinance into a 30-year loan, you've got one of those rolling 30-year loans. And then one day you retire and you still owe a lot of money. So don't get caught in that trap. And it's worth, I think, underscoring the fact that um, a lot of the you know, property spruikers say, well, you know, never mind, as long as you can go on repaying, it's all fine. But I think that's a very narrow way of thinking about the situation because, you know, you end up paying a lot more over the life of the loan. And um, there is still the old strategy of paying as much as you can afford to pay to reduce the loan early because that gives you more capacity later. Yeah, it does. And and look, with loans these days, uh, uh, almost all of them, and if you find one that doesn't do this, don't take it, but almost all of them allow you to make extra repayments. Now, these are variable rate loans. Fixed rates are the dinner. But almost all of them allow you to make extra repayments and almost all of them give you the ability to redraw. Uh, now, a redraw means that you pay this money in, you get the benefit because you've knocked your, your principal down faster, you pay less interest over the term, you pay off the loan faster, but redraw is a great thing because it gives you this, this um, little safety net that if you need the money for another purpose, you can get it back. So redraw is a great thing. Uh, it didn't exist you know, 20 years ago, but it does now take advantage of it. And it's at a better rate because it offsets uh, the, 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 uh, the, the loan interest rate. So you're effectively getting the loan interest rate on your savings, not uh, a lower savings account rate. Now, you don't actually get paid the interest, so you don't have that benefit, but it, it knocks it off your mortgage, off your, off your loan. Uh, it's a it's a great way to get ahead. Uh, didn't exist before, does now. Make sure you use it. Make sure you make extra repayments, and then you, if you do need it for a, for education, for an emergency, for a loss of job, for health issues, uh, or even for a holiday, you can still get it. Mm. And it is interesting because uh, I've discovered in my surveys that some people, quite a few people, actually don't know the mortgage rate they're on, so they actually don't probably understand the concept of interest ticking up and you know what that does over time so it is actually worth jumping on some of the modeling and just look at what it means in terms of the overall payments that you make and how it varies with interest rates and those sorts of things because being a bit more aware of these facts are pretty important aren't they uh they are look i encourage people to play with the calculators you know, the, the, I love our calculator. I play with it all the time. It's, it's a great thing. Now, what it does <laughs> is that it enables you to put in the interest rate, say the interest rate you started on, and you put that in and it will show you how your repayments uh, work over time. And you'll see there's this pattern and it goes like this and that's the principle of the loan reducing. Now, it starts, uh, you started with $500,000 you borrowed and it gradually over the 30 years goes down and down and then over the last few years, it just falls off a cliff and, and just crashes right down almost vertically for the last couple of years. And that's because um, uh, as you approach the end of the loan, you're not paying anywhere near as much. You might be paying the same repayment if the rate hasn't changed, but you're not paying anywhere near as much interest. You just gradually whittle down the interest component early on and, and then you get to the point where you're paying almost all principal and you knock off the last bit fast. So play around with that and then start changing the interest rate up and finding out what that means to repayments and all the rest of it so that you can plan ahead and say, look, one day repayments will be higher. Well, we've already seen that now. Uh, but one day they'll be higher and I need to understand what I could be up for and what it would mean to the loan. 
Yeah, and that's a really important point, Steve, because particularly people on interest-only loans, you know, mm. that they pay less because they're only paying the interest element. But in the early years, most of the uh, payment, in any ways, is interest. But, of course, at the end of the life of the loan, they're still stuck with repaying the capital because the capital is not reduced on an interest-only loan, whereas on a principal and interest loan, it is reduced. But in the early years, the bulk of what you're paying is not reducing capital. The bulk of what you're paying is just interest. Yeah, so look, there, are, there are good reasons for investors to have interest-only loans. They want to keep their capital dry for the next deal and they want to um, uh, keep their tax position favourable. Uh, but for an owner-occupier, for the house you're living in, for your prime residence, it doesn't make sense. It is just a last resort because you can't afford the repayments. Treat it as a last resort and that's it. Um, now, the banks are prepared to do five-year deals or three-year deals of interest only. They're getting a bit tougher on that if you don't have plenty of equity. But they, they can be, you, know, you can talk a banker into it, uh, but, uh, but treat it as, look, I'm doing this just for now. And that's it, purely and simply. The other thing is that you get to the end of the interest only period and most banks say, all right, now you've had five years of your 30-year term, so now we'll calculate your repayment over 25 years and that means that you're on a higher repayment than you would have been on if you'd gone principal and interest from the start so you know, there is no free lunch uh, and interest only loans are not interest free loans they're interest only and you will be in a tighter spot when you get through that period so be ready for that treat as a last resort Yes, and it's worth underscoring again, isn't it, that the old expectation was that uh, your income would have grown substantially over the four or five years, which means mm. that when you come to actually switch, you've got a bigger pool of income. Unfortunately, in the last few years, real income growth has gone negative. So essentially, mm. you can't assume there's going to be a get-out-of-jail card in four or five years with a massive spike in income relative to now. And that's, again, something that I think many people don't actually process sufficiently when they make those early decisions. Yeah, and APRA clamped down in, I think it was 2014, Martin, it was somewhere around that time anyway, they clamped down on interest only lending uh, because they came to that realisation as well. They said, look, uh, bankers were so keen to write business this way because they could get people into bigger loans and, and, people, and, and people could afford the repayments. And prior to, you know, sort of 2010 or something, um, you know, they'd been a pretty good solution because uh, wages growth was pretty healthy, people would get to the end of a five-year period compounding wage growth on top of wage growth and they'd be able to afford a decent repayment and start knocking down the principal. Uh, but uh, when we hit 2014, we'd gone through a period already by then of very low wage growth and uh, people were getting to the end of interest-only loans or about to reach the end of interest-only loans and uh, the incomes hadn't gone up much at all, and they weren't able to, to afford the principal reductions, let alone the principal and interest payments. Now, with rates going up as well. So, yeah, the product has been shown to be very, very flawed and, um, uh, and, and not suitable for most people. Mm. And yet, of course, it was part of the reason why house prices accelerated dramatically, because um, the unfortunately, it is uh, house prices are directly correlated to availability of credit, and availability <laughs> of credit increases when you only have to pay back the interest element rather than the capital element. So that's another reason why we saw this uh, this really wacky relationship between between the two. Let's just switch over to um, deposits briefly before we finish, because um, deposit rates are also moving around a bit too, aren't they? Yeah, they are. Um, they um, and, and and they would be. They should be, um, uh, but they're not moving as fast as they should. <laughs> that's the, the in, in in a simple word. That's the problem. Uh, and you know, the, the the banks have built up such large deposit bases during uh, the COVID period, where people were locked down and, and expecting the worst, and just put money in the savings, couldn't go on holidays, stuff like that. Uh, so they built up big deposit bases and. They hit a record of oh, two-thirds of, of their lending was actually being funded, their, their home loans were actually being funded from household deposits, household savings. Now, that's super high. You know, normally it's been around half. It worked its way right up there. So they've had this real luxury of 
of not having to chase deposits anywhere near as hard as they might have in the past. Now, they've uh, given us, say, they've given savers um, increases to their savings rates, but selectively. <laughs> uh, typically, a bank will have two, two uh, uh, savings style products. One will be a, a bonus account, and one will either be sort of just a basic, simple, here's, here's a single rate, uh, or it will be a single rate with a promotional type intro period. Uh, and they've got these two. Now, what the banks have done through this period, in a lot of cases, is that they have uh, given half of, uh, half of their customers an increase this month and then the other half uh, an increase uh, the next month. Uh, so right away, you're behind the eight ball, and then very often they've not given the full amount that the Reserve Bank has increased by. So instead of giving 0.5%, they'll give 0.4% or 0.3%. Uh, so it, it's put depositors right behind the eight ball. Now, I mentioned those promotional accounts. In some cases, they've, they've given that, that increase to the promotional, not the base rate. Now, the promotional rate is only available for new customers for two, three, four, five months. And if they put the increase through to the promotional rate, then the existing uh, depositors do not get it. The existing accounts do not get it. So uh, the outcome is that you know, most savings products have only received about oh, half of the increase that, um, that uh, the Reserve Bank has put through. Uh, bonus accounts have, have fared best, uh, but, uh, but others have uh, nowhere near as well. So uh, the base rate for, um, uh, for those promotional rates that I was talking about before, and I'm looking at my notes here, uh, the base rate has only improved to. I need a drum roll here. Will I? Will I find it? <laughs> um, to one on average to one point oh four percent. Now the Reserve Bank, and it was from a very low base around 0.15 percent, so it's gone up about 0.9. The Reserve Bank has put its rate up by two point two five percent. So you are way behind the eight ball if your money is sitting lazily in uh, a base, in, in one of these promotional accounts that has a base rate because uh, you're not getting the, the full benefit of the promotional increase and your base rate hasn't gone up much. Uh, so don't be lazy about your money. We've got to get the banks, uh, uh, get the banks more keen and, and more appreciative of this group that is funding the savings group. Currently, they're, they're funding some lower offers for new borrowers uh, through, uh, through reasonable rates for, for customers. But the savings group of customers are actually subsidizing as they have, as they have been for years now. They've been patient. Uh, this should be their time in the sun, and they're not quite getting it. Now, there's a thing called yield management, which all the banks don't really want to talk about, but this is precisely mm. what they're doing, which essentially mm -hmm. is squeezing the difference between the loan rates and the deposit rates. And they're pretty um, nifty, as you say, at sort of yes. slicing and dicing and doing a bit here and a bit there. They're assuming that most people are too lazy or too uneducated to actually know what's going on. And unfortunately, many people, therefore, are not receiving what they should be receiving on those deposit um, balances that they hold and that's a problem um, and whilst they can sort of uh, you know attract um, those um, uh, people on the loan side with those teaser rates and things and those uh, cashback things it's the depositors who are paying the price and unfortunately mm -hmm. the truth is there are more depositors than there are borrowers yeah and yet everybody keeps talking about these mortgage rates almost nobody's talking about this big important point on the deposit side of the equation. Yeah, that's, that's, that's dead right. And I, I also extracted the bond rates this month uh, just because I thought it was interesting to have a look at it. And the three-year bond rate going back to September 21 was only 10 basis points. The Reserve Bank was holding it down, uh, so 0.10%. Now it's up around you know 3.7% roughly. Uh, and the five year is oh, about the same. It's it's uh, it's also gone up to around the same level. So the 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 those rates have gone up dramatically. Uh, the wholesale funding costs that the banks have to pay. So when they borrow from the big super funds, for example, for example, 
um, which they do a lot of, in particular to fund their uh, their fixed rate loans, um, they'll be up well over that 3.7%. So the squeeze is on the banks for the wholesale end of the market. And that's why fixed rate loans have gone up a lot faster than variable rate loans and a lot earlier. But, um, but what's happening is that the person, the group that's effectively paying for that extra cost of wholesale funding is actually the saving customer, <laughs> not the borrowing customer. Uh, so the savings customer is because they're being squeezed at the other end while the bank's being squeezed but at the wholesale end. And, uh, and who's paying for it? It's the poor old saver who's had a pretty rough trot since 2010. And I guess it's worth highlighting, Steve, again, shopping around and looking at the different uh, propositions that are out there because there are some reasonably decent deals available on the deposit side of the ledger, but only if you go find them. Yeah, there, there are. I mean, the difference between an average rate and a, uh, a top rate is around, um, ooh, um, on, on, on a base savings account, it's uh, it's over t- it's one point two percent different on a bonus account. It's one point six percent different uh, on a on a three year term deposit. Uh, the difference between the average rate and the um, uh, the maximum rate is one point two five percent. So there are better rates to be had. You can get yourself one percent more now. You know it's not like the the. the the great days when inflation was running out of control and you're sort of looking at 10% deposit accounts. Uh, they're only 4% deposit accounts, but you can still get them. So so look for them. You know, your term deposits are up around 4% now, the better rates, and uh, and you can still get um, on that core money, you can get over 3%. Make sure you're getting a good deal. Yeah, and that's very important because quite a few people in my surveys who have uh, some deposits tend to be older and perhaps often mm. without a mortgage, but they are really experiencing huge pressures because of the CPI increases, the cost of living increases. So being able to boost your returns from your deposits can make a huge difference in terms of the cash flow for those households. So that's why this is an important conversation. Yeah, that's that's the group that um, are probably the biggest kind of personal saver group uh, because they uh, – you know, if, you, if you're if you're in your your fifties, you're inclined to say, "Look, I, uh, I know the risks in, in equities, but I'll put a fair chunk of my savings into equities because I've got time to recover if there's a crash." Uh, but if you're in your seventies, you sort of look at it and say, "Well, if there's a crash, uh, I might not be around by the time the markets recover." So they're the group that have pretty hefty savings in uh, in bank deposits, term deposits, and, and, and other act call accounts. Uh, and and you know they they're not there's no immunity from uh, inflation because they're in their seventies they've got to pay the higher prices uh, uh, but uh, but when rates are falling uh, they they have less income for the higher prices as rates are rising it means prices are going up as well uh, but uh, but they haven't been getting that full increase as the rates have gone up so uh, they're stretching their dollar a lot further now. Yeah, and this is this cross subsidisation issue again. So you know, all the banks are fighting for those mortgage refinings, but it is unfortunately a larger group of savers who are actually being hit. But I guess the, in the bottom line, on both the loan side and the savings side, is you can't just set and forget. You know, you've got to be proactive here. You've got to be actually looking to see what rates are available, and things change quite often. And we've had this conversation many, many times, Steve, haven't we? But it is actually the apathy tax ultimately. You know, if, if you don't get proactive about what rates you're getting or what rates you're being charged, um, you're going to be paying a lot more on either a loan or indeed on deposits. You'll be getting a lot less than you might otherwise be getting. And, and these are big amounts of money that you're missing out on supporting the bank's profits and i keep saying to people why are you doing that why are you actually supporting these massive financial institutions when actually it's more important for you to be able to get the maximum you can from the deposits you've got or avoid paying what you can avoid paying on your loans to enhance your cash flow because in the current environment cash flow is king yep uh, if you have had a loan for five years even more so, 10 years. Uh, but if you've had a loan for five years and you have never renegotiated your rate with the bank, you are paying too much. 
you know, it is, categorically you are paying too much and uh, and and you're paying too much on a big sum of money. It's uh, you know maybe, maybe it's half a million, maybe because it was ten years ago, maybe you only borrowed a quarter of a million, but it's still a lot of money. Don't gift it to the bank. If you're a saver uh, and you're not looking at uh, your rates every twelve months uh, or at the maturity of every term deposit, if, if you've got term deposits, um, then you probably are uh, uh, again gifting the bank too much uh, by not getting a good enough rate. Uh, so don't let that happen. Uh, make sure you fully explore it and, and just set, set a little anniversary for it. Set an anniversary for every, you know, if you're a borrower, every two or three years, and if you're a saver, every 12 months. Uh, it's easy to switch in both cases now. You can do it online without going into the bank in a lot of cases. Uh, so, uh, so don't don't ignore it. Uh, a little bit of effort um, goes a long way when it's financial services, in particular when it's a mortgage. But if you're on, if you're retired on a, a fairly hefty uh, lump of savings and, and superannuation, uh, in that case as well, it's a it's a big amount of money for a minimum eff effort. Try doing that by tightening the belt on the weekly grocery shop. Uh, you'll never get the same outcome that way. So don't be the one that ignores it. No, it's just very important because, unfortunately, relationship banking doesn't imply that the banks look after you at all, right? So basically yes. they assume that if you're quiet, that you're, they just quietly milk you. Right? I mean, it is, it is, frankly, that bad, isn't it? Uh, yeah, look, it is. Uh, the, the bank um, will take care of people who, uh, who pop their head up and say, look, I'm not happy. Uh, I'm a good customer. I know I'm a good customer. I keep repaying my, my loan. I keep giving you my savings. I'm a good customer. I deserve to get as good a deal as the new customers you're attracting. Uh, uh, and, uh, but, but the bank will say, well, all right, now if, if then you go away and, and say nothing for the next several years, well, their judgment would be that you're happy enough. And, uh, and why upset the apple cart and give away a fair chunk of our margin uh, if you're happy enough and you're not going to leave. Uh, ultimately, sometimes you have to say, I'm on my way out unless I get this deal uh, because, uh, you know, that's that's uh, the thing that does focus your bank and uh, and your banker and, uh, and get you the decent deal. Mm, yeah, well, I, say, I look at uh, households and particular categorisation of what I call delegators and soloists. So soloists are people who know what the rates they're paying are and regularly check them. The delegators sort of assume that somebody else is doing it or they yeah. just, uh, you know, don't bother, right? About half of households are in the delegator group. So mm -hmm. they actually don't know much about their interest rates. They haven't done much checking recently. And whether they've got a mortgage or whether they've actually got um, deposits, they're actually getting a worse deal. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and this is another one of your cross subsidisations. Yeah, <laughs> your 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 delegators are actually subsidising the soloists. Uh, now, does that feel good if you're a delegator? I don't think so. So make sure you're a soloist. Make sure you're taking control of your own finances and telling your bank be the order giver, uh, not the order taker. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, just to underscore, you know, what you said, it is so much simpler these days, you know, with the comparison sites like CanStar, for example, you know, you can look down the list and see the best deals there. And the switching process is so much more straightforward than it used to be, mm -hmm. uh, which is good. So there really is no excuse not to do this. And uh, I keep saying to people, this is the simplest way to deal with your cash flow crisis, if you've got a crisis, right? Or if you've not got a crisis yet, Take the opportunity now to prepare because we said at the start, rates are going to go higher. That's going to put more pressure on mortgages. And uh, again, there's an opportunity on the deposit side to maximise the returns there. So this is a really critical thing to be thinking about. And I know it's not very, very exciting relative to the footy or going down to the beach. But actually, from a financial perspective, this is probably the most simple thing that anybody can do. Yeah, look, it's it's sort of um, look, it's a, it's a rainy afternoon's bit of work actually. Um, uh, you you uh, at least to decide to get you to the starting point. 
you know, on a rainy afternoon, open up the website, look at all of these loans, all of these deposit accounts, rank them in terms of price, uh, then uh, then start to understand what else you're looking for in the product, and 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 that gets you the starting point. Uh, but then with a lot of products, you know, with with deposit products, for example, you do it online, so you can you can get it done straight away. Uh, with loans, yep, you've got to put applications in and all that stuff, but it's still online. It's a lot easier than it used to be, and the banks are so hungry uh, for refinance business where people have built up some equity. Uh, they, they didn't borrow at the top of the market. They, they loans a reasonable, affordable figure. Banks are hungry for, for that sort of business, and, uh, and you know, it, they, they, it's, it's easier to apply and to get approved these days than it ever has been in the past. So put the effort in. Put the effort in and do, do it now because, you know, every day you don't do this, every day you put it off is just more uh, that you, you're giving away to the bank, that you're gifting to the bank rather than putting it into your own household finances. Absolutely. Well, I'm conscious of the fact that rain is forecast down the East Coast over the weekend. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. this is a great weekend. So maybe we should create, uh, you know, the weekend. This is the, the check your rates weekend, to, you know, yeah, rainy yeah. afternoon. Yeah. Check your rates. Yeah, people should be celebrating that it's pouring with rain and, <laughs> and they can't do anything in the garden or, or go out for their nice walks and play their sport and all that stuff. Uh, so people should be celebrating that with uh, a day in front of the computer and in front of CanStar and, uh, and find, uh, find a, a much better deal. Yeah, there are plenty of deals out there. Steve, I appreciate your time and your advice, as always. Really important conversation. And, and while some people say, well, you keep saying the same thing. Yeah, we keep saying the same thing because it's such a critical issue and so many people still haven't got the message. So we just keep at it, eh? Yeah, I've, I've, I'm keeping at it. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Thank you very much. Take care. See you soon. Thanks, Martin. Cheers. Bye-bye.